Stocks have hit a wall. Technology and semiconductors couldn't save the US market this time and things are looking very, very weak. Furthermore, US bond auctions are sending yields rallying and just when things were looking bullish, the market humbles those who get complacent. So what does this mean for stocks ahead of inflation data tomorrow and where do markets go from here? Today, we're going to talk about that and consumer confidence, labor market productivity and the all important earnings. Is the sell-off we're seeing in markets now an opportunity or is it the start of something more sinister? We've got a lot to talk about. But let's roll the tape. Welcome everybody to the daily recap show where we talk about stocks and the financial markets. My name is Chase. Guys, if you like this video, please subscribe, hit that notification bell, like this video and leave a comment for the algorithm. Let's get into it. Now looking at the S&P 500, this is a daily heat map, a little bit of a dumpster fire here for the market as a whole, especially when you don't get participation from semiconductors as well as some of these like tech names and the market can actually sell off pretty brutally especially when you have like meta and google uh, microsoft apple getting flat or down for the day we saw software application you know crm had their earnings today so these three names are running up into crm's earnings we're going to talk about them a little later in the video so they were pretty green today then we had some other notable names that were kind of flat berkshire amazon eli Lilly, johnson and johnson but it was just a risk off liquidation move across the board today i mean even look at stuff like defensives utilities basic materials right a consumer staples even certain places in healthcare healthcare plans this is the real defensive component of healthcare even they were down quite significantly here today so it was a risk off it was a liquidation it was just sell equity get cash there wasn't much of a defensive rotation the only green we saw had to do with earnings plays with regards to like you know software because there was a number of software names reporting here today. And then obviously NVIDIA, because of its earnings, was up 0.81%. And not a single sector was positive here today. The SPY was down 0.7%. Software, the best performing, down 0.28%. That's probably going to change tomorrow. XLC down 0.53%. Technology 0.63%. And then discretionary 0.66%. So a lot of the stocks in these sectors are like mega cap stocks. And they did outperform the market stuff like Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, NVIDIA. But then everything else was a bit of a dumpster fire. And gold miners down 2.52%. Uh, Same with regional banks. XLE down 1.77%. Same with semiconductors. Metals and mining. Yeah, just a, a dumpster fire across the board. So we had a very brutal day in the market. The S&P 500 down 0.74%. The NASDAQ roughly the same. The IWM 1.48%. Look at the RSP down 1.17%. Mid caps 2 uh, and SP 600 lost about 1.2% there. We can actually see in the after hours, things not looking too great as well. And down 0.41% here in extended trading hours. Value is looking a bit upbeat, but a very, very rough time the markets had here today. And it was all dependent on yields. Yesterday's bond auction was actually really, really bad. We spoke about it in yesterday's video. Essentially, the bond auction tailed the yield by about like 0.05%. We saw uh, yields actually move in a very very big way i mean they were up yesterday 1.95 percent this is the 10-year yield and again today up 1.36 percent and then we also saw crude move down 0.75 percent here but still up for the week in aggregate now let's actually look at the s p 500 and a couple of things part of the reason why we're seeing quite a bit of volatility here actually has to do with the fact that we are in negative gamma so just to give you guys some context right the gamma flip zone 52 95 area that is the gamma flip zone so below this area we are in a heavy a heavily negative uh, gamma environment now i did say that this right here is the first support zone and that's actually what happened today however you can actually see at today's candle this was today's candle on the close we actually did close the lows of the day that's a very very ominous candle so can we actually push lower into tomorrow 100 so where would we find support if that happens literally just the the 5200 zone that's the next key level of support if we actually just pull up the gamma chart right here you could see it very very clearly 5200 is the next biggest strike after 5000 so we're definitely going to find support at this zone right here now gamma flip the gamma flip is at 5300 and the core resistance continues to be at the 5400 area and i would really only start to get worried if this actually moves down i don't think it's going to move down and we are exiting the window of weakness so i think that you know a lot of the selling we're seeing is probably going to stop at the 5200 if not it's going to be here at the 5250 area so i think we're going to find support uh, either right here and then make a move higher or we're going to get to this 5200 zone and then we're going to find support from there so either two things are going to happen we're going to find support here and we're going to rally 
and then knock the bears off that socks or we're going to move lower into the 5200 area where we're going to find support at uh the support zone right here either way fundamentally everything's looking good and a lot's going to be dependent on the gdp numbers tomorrow so uh, you want to be buyers of dips right here looking for all-time highs or buyers of dips at the 5200 area looking for all-time highs guys it's just all going to be dependent on the macro numbers that come out tomorrow now looking at market sentiment today we're going to look at the fear and greed index essentially the question asked is what emotion is driving the market right now and right now we're in the neutral camp despite all-time highs in the s p 500 and the nasdaq being made in the last week so very very weird to see neutral sentiment at all-time highs that probably means we can go higher and actually what this tells me is that the contrarian trade is probably to the upside because normally when markets are at all-time highs you normally see greed extreme greed the fact that we are here at neutral tells me that a lot of people don't believe in the rally and that probably means we go higher now we can actually see just a week ago we were in greed territory and a month ago we were in fear and two months ago we were actually in greed as well so we pretty much went from greed into fear back into greed and now we're in the neutral camp and it does look like we're probably going to move back into this greed territory if we continue to make new all-time highs and if we do get broader market participation that being said market is neutral right now despite having made all-time highs in the last week in the s p 500 and tech and semiconductors rallying very very weird to see this and trust me at all-time highs you want to be pretty greedy but that is simply not the case and expect more upside from here it might not be tomorrow it might not be the day after but I think for the rest of 2025, you can definitely expect more upside. I do think we're going to move into this greed territory by the end of the year, be somewhere close to the extreme greed territory. Now let's actually look at some stats. This is the S&P 500 performance in June over the last 50 years. And we got three different trades that we want to look at. So this is when Jan to May is negative and when Jan to May is zero to 8%. And this is where we are in 2024, when Jan to May is greater than 8%. You can see that January to May returned 11 11.24% and normally momentum brings momentum when January to May is positive June tends to be very very positive average return 2.34% 14 up years three down years a very positive hit rate and like I said momentum brings momentum but it's also to the downside have a look at this just for context when Jan to May is negative even if it is negative 0.1% normally June tends to be negative down 2.04% or up up years 11 down years so a very very negative hit rate right there and that's why momentum can also bring momentum to the downside and the upside so guys when a market is bullish and running you want to be bullish because momentum brings momentum but we can also see here when the market is neutral when Jan to May is up anywhere from zero to eight percent we actually do get fairly positive returns 13 positive years five down years 0.93 percent return here in June so stay long and don't fight the trend now let's actually talk Talk about earnings this is the earnings scorecard that bofa have given us my data is a bit different but it's good to look at different points of data just to see where the average is because the truth is somewhere in the middle now this is s p 500 earnings now we're going to look at the year over year figures simply because the quarter of a quarter don't really pertain well to where we are right now you see q4 is normally a very very good quarter for stocks across the board and then q1 tends to be the weakest part of the year so quarter of a quarter returns are always going to be negative as you can see but we want to look at the year over year to get relative comparables now s p 500 earnings returning 6.4 percent x financials 5.6 x energy 9.6 x financials and energy 9.4 percent and then on the sales side which is essentially just revenue the s p 500 is up 4.1 percent year over year 3.6 percent x financials 4.8 percent excluding energy and plus 4.4 percent excluding financials and energy so earnings looking very very good revenue also looking very very good but this is the year and now now, what about the rest of 2024 and even though expectations are very high for the second quarter and the second half into 2024 consensus estimates for the remainder of 2024 remain largely unchanged quarter to date this right here this chart is the change in consensus estimates for the second third and fourth quarter earnings for 2024 since april 1st as of the 23rd of may so essentially this is the changes and i'll explain to you what this looks like so essentially let's say s p 500 earnings is 
supposed to come in at 10% for 2024. This 0.2% increase right here means that earnings are now expected to come in at 10.2%. For the Magnificent Seven, if earnings are expected to come in at 15% for the end of the year, they're now expected to come in at 16.8%. And as you can see, S&P 500 earnings have actually been revised to the upside 0.2%. That has mostly been driven by the Magnificent Seven, which is up 1.8%. You know, the market excluding the Mag 7, excluding tech and excluding energy have been revised down 0.2% and 0.1%. Now, the best sectors here have actually been energy, utilities, and comp services. They've all been revised to the upside 3.5%, 2.7%, and 1.3%. And then financials, tech discretionary, 0.6, 0.6, and 0.2%. Those are upward revisions. And then downward revisions have actually been materials, real estate, staples, healthcare, and industrials, the worst, having been revised down 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 1 0.2, 1 1.4, and 2.9% respectively. And we can see that the big sectors, tech, financials, home services have all been revised to the upside. And that's why we're seeing huge revisions here in the MAG7, as well as the S&P 500 as a whole. Now, what are the actual expectations for the second, third, and fourth quarter 2024? Now, we are expecting 10.9% here in the fourth quarter, 8.6% growth in the second quarter, and 14.9% in the fourth quarter for the S&P 500 for a full calendar year earnings of 10.7% growth and 4.5% revenue growth. Growth. And that leaves us with a valuation for the full year 2024 at 21.6. But if we look ahead four quarters, it's actually 20.9. And then based on 2025 earnings, the S&P 500 trades at a forward PE of 18.9. And that assumes we grow earnings in 2024 at 10.7% and 2025 at 14.2%. So based on 2025 earnings, the S&P 500 looking very, very attractive at 18.9 times, especially because I consider 20 times to be fair value for the S&P 500. Now let's actually talk about earnings today and we're going to look at Salesforce. We're going to dive into their earnings in detail, but we had quite a number of companies report C3AI, Unipath, Okta, as well as Abercrombie Fitch, Chewy, Dick Sporting Goods, Advanced Auto Parts. And there was nothing to ride home about. We had some winners. We had some losers. Such goes the market. Tomorrow, we also have Costco, Dell, Zscaler, Marvell, MongoDB, Ulta Beauty, Sentinel One after the close, as well as Foot Locker, Dollar General, and Best Buy. But let's dive into Salesforce. Now, Salesforce earnings, bit of a dumpster fire here in after hours, down 17%. The compounder bros are in shambles. Joseph Carlson is in shambles. This dude just started buying Salesforce at the top, down 17% in his position here. The reason why they actually fell had to do with this revenue figure right here. They reported 9.1 billion in revenue. Street was expecting 9.31. That's what the stock was priced for. They did beat on EPS, however, 237 against $2.29. Also, they left guidance unchanged. Some people said they missed on guidance. My data says they actually left guidance unchanged revenue 9% year over year to 38 billion operating margin 20% but yeah the street just didn't like the fact that they missed on revenue especially when you have Salesforce and AI play at least a lot of people considered it an AI play why are they missing on revenue these are the questions you have to ask the street didn't want to ask they just reacted and that reaction was to sell the stock down 17% in after hours in the live stream a little later we're going to discuss if it's a buy opportunity right now but not good earnings here for Salesforce. Pretty bad day for Salesforce as a whole. I do believe this was the first revenue miss since 2006, and software is actually going to be in the dumpster fire tomorrow when the market opens. Now let's talk a bit about the economy. Now, this is the non-farm business labor productivity index, and pretty much this tells us we are probably on the verge of another productivity super cycle. Productivity, the labor productivity index is defined as output growth minus change in hours work, and we're seeing the start of a trend right here, very, very similar to what we saw in the early 90s into the early mid 2000s and here's why this is so important you see when we get high productivity growth that leads to disinflation and lower inflation lower inflation means easier policy there's simply no reason to keep rates high easier policy means more investment more investment means stronger employment stronger employment means higher wage growth higher wage growth leads to higher productivity growth and then the cycle just starts all over again and in an environment where productivity growth is accelerating you actually want to own growth stocks. Growth stocks often outperform in periods of strong productivity growth and the best way to capture alpha in the market in a productivity super cycle is actually to look at the secular trends and get on board those. I'm talking about the AI trade as well as anything related to technology. I'd also say look at stuff like energy. That's going to be a big beneficiary of AI. 
utilities as well. And I do think stuff like fintech and financials, we're going to see huge disruption of that industry. So as long as productivity keeps rising on the back of AI, the beneficiaries of that will be growth stocks. And the beneficiaries of that have been growth stocks in the past and even in recent history. But let's switch gears, talk about another measure in the economy, consumer confidence. Now we got the latest data here from the conference board, and I actually prefer their consumer confidence measure over the University of Michigan's index, simply because the University University of Michigan is very sensitive to inflation, whereas the conference board is geared towards labor market data. And we actually saw a huge uptick here in the conference board's consumer confidence data. And the expectation for this data print was to come in at 95. This print at the bottom was 92. We actually got 102. So it was a very, very big beat. And part of the reason why we're actually seeing upbeat consumer confidence data has to actually do with weakening economic data. The economic data has actually come in a little bit weaker than expected. You can see here in the last month, the US surprise index has actually steeply moved lower. That has to do with just weaker economic data prints, stuff like CPI and NFP did come in a little bit weaker. And that's why we saw consumer confidence tick up in a very big way. But the data we got wasn't so bad as to cause major concerns about a potential recession or slowing economic conditions. But looking at other measures of economic strength, particularly in the real economy, this is US rail traffic here for the 20th week, 2024, ending May 18th. We can actually see that US rail traffic this week is up 6.2% versus 2023 and up 0.9% in total traffic versus 2023 on a year to date basis, up 8.5% in total intermodal units, and then total traffic up 2%. And this total traffic figure is actually highly correlated to GDP. And to see it coming at 2% is rather constructive in the here and now. Now looking at another measure for market momentum, this right here is the OEX open interest ratio. And oftentimes when this ratio does near this one level or in between one and zero, it often coincides with either a bottom or is the middle of a rally you could see here in 2020 we bottomed out the oex ratio hit this one level at the same time here in 2021 at the middle of the rally in 2022 when we pulled back the bottom formed right here when we hit the zero level in the oex ratio you can see right here in 2024 at this bottom right here the OEX ratio hits zero, and it probably means that further upside is due in the market. Smart money is definitely buying the market despite what market technicals, market sentiment, and overall market momentum is doing now. In the very long term, the path of least resistance is higher. Now, looking at data tomorrow, the big one is PCE, guys. We're looking for a 0.3% month over month headline, 2.7% year over year, and then 0.3% in core month over month, 2.8% year over year in the core figure. So, that is the consensus expectation. This is Bofa's expectation. And we also have the personal savings rate coming out on the same day at the same time, as well as the purchasing managers index. But if you've made it up until here, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please subscribe, hit the notification bell, like this video and leave a comment for the algorithm. Cheers.